Hello and welcome back. Today I'd like to talk about some simple variations on the early medieval tunic and gown, nine variations in all, that will give you a lot more choices in how you wear this and what styles you can get out of it. If this pattern looks familiar to you, then this class is for you. If you're a little bit lost looking at this, I suggest you go back to the first video that I made and re-watch the first few minutes where I review this pattern. I'll put the link down in the description. Characteristics of this style. It does have a drop shoulder seam and it requires belting to bring in the waist. So it does accentuate shoulder width in most cases. It also has some looseness built in for ease of motion. The first variation I'm going to talk about then is how to get rid of that dropped shoulder. If you wish, instead of cutting the main front and back body panels to the circumference of your body, you can cut it to the width of your shoulders. This makes the shoulders look narrower and adding these extra seams gives you more opportunities to shape and fit the garment if you want something that's going to be more fitted. You need to add some side panels below the sleeve to make up the difference between your body circumference and the distance between your shoulders, but that's pretty easy to do. You already know what size of body panel you need to go around your body. You simply look for the difference between that and your shoulder size, and that will be the size of your side panel. Add a seam allowance to each and you're ready to go. You also have to cut the sleeve a little bit longer because it's set into the body. Historically, this pattern was used especially by cultures that wove their fabric in somewhat narrower widths, and so they had to do more sewing and piecing in order to get the same basic shape of garment out of their fabrics. We already talked about length and the ways that length influenced medieval fashion. Just a reminder that you have a lot of choices here, and it's an easy variation to make on the pattern. You can also vary the width or the fullness of the lower hem by adding as many triangles as you wish to have increased fullness. This would reflect increased wealth or richness. Every seam can have a godet added to it. If you want to add godets in a place where there aren't any seams, like in the center front and the center back, this can be a little bit tricky to get the top point to look good and to have enough seam allowances inside of there to be really structurally sound. Personally, if you're new to sewing, I would recommend that you simply add a center front and center back seam all the way up the garment because that gives you a much easier seam allowance to work with. You can flip it and take out all the godets. They're straight sided and they're split just above the point of the hip so that people can move. We see this both in northern climates and in southern climates. Although in hot Mediterranean climate, like in Rome, you might see men wearing this with no sleeves at all. In Northern Europe, generally long sleeve shirts year round, but made out of lighter weight fabric. You can also change the shape of your sleeve. Even though this style of construction is not really friendly to a highly fitted upper arm and shoulder, you can still get a lot of fitting out of the lower arm. You can tighten it up a lot across the wrist to the point where you can't even pull it over your hand. If you do that, you just open up the seam, reinforce it, and then add some sort of closure like lacing or buttons or hooks and eyes, etc., etc. And you can always go bigger. You can go wide. And if you go wide enough at the body, you can skip the underarm gusset and save yourself a little bit of sewing. These wide lower sleeves I've shown on the right are best known as the bliol, which is a type of high medieval gown that is really recognizable and fairly famous. So it's a good search term. And you can always make sleeves shorter. As a matter of fact, with a lot of the layered medieval styles, we find that the sleeve in every layer gets a little bit shorter than the layer below it. That lets people show off all the layers that they're wearing, all of the different colors, and all of the different fabrics. Similarly, you can very easily change the neckline. While I showed you a basic keyhole neck, which is extremely fitted, you can also do a larger neck hole that you can put your head through. The calculations are similar, but you use the circumference of your head rather than the circumference of your neck. 
Wide ovals and rectangles were very, very common. Larger circles are seen sometimes as well. And we see some cases where they take that wide rectangle and then add an offset slit to one side. That reflects an Eastern influence, either the Near East or the Steppe peoples, and this conversation that different cultures were having with each other over space and over time. And then, I've already alluded to this a little bit, you can split any seam open and then close it again. You can do this with necks, you can do it with sleeves, and you can do it with the center front or even the sides of the body. You can open it up and lace it back together. We see string and cord ties as really the simplest solution, and buttons or toggles and loops are found throughout history. They've been around forever. Lacing is our classic medieval style where we lace things in to get really tight fitting. Hook and eye is unique to the Anglo-Saxon period and then disappears for a few centuries and shows up again in the early Renaissance. And then lots and lots of different pins, which over time might be known as a fibula or a brooch. Buttonholes are quirky because they showed up in Eastern Europe a lot earlier than they showed up in Western Europe. We don't see them in Western Europe very much until after the Crusades, where they brought the idea home from the East. Buttons took off in the 1300s and went absolutely crazy for a little over 100 years. Those are quickly all of the pattern changes that you can make. So I'd like to take it now to a historical example. Let's look at this knight from an image out of England in 1250-ish. We can see that he has no sleeves, and we know from other images of the period that these are generally round necklines that pull on over the head. We know that the body has to be loose enough to go over his armor, and we can see that it is split in the center front and the center back. Knights were horse riders, and so their garments were split to make it easier to ride on horses. And in this period, these are calf-length garments, again, based on this and other images from the era. If you want the center front split and the center back split, again, you may just want to add a seam that goes all the way up and assume that no one is really going to notice it, especially if you decorate this with some sort of arms. Alternately, you might make the two sides of the garment in different colors, showing off heraldry. Now on to ways to embellish it. You can dress up an existing garment after the fact by adding trim, woven trim, or braid, or fabric. There's a lot of different sizes and shapes of this, and you can just find an inspiration photo and copy it. But essentially, these are stitched onto the top of something you've already made. These are most common in high wear areas. There are places where garments take a lot of wear around the neck, the ends of the sleeves, and the lower hems, and those are the places where historically we're most likely to see extra layers of trim or fabric stitched on in an ornamental fashion. If you're wanting to be a bit more historical and you're aiming for someone before the 1400s, the modern selvage edge ribbon didn't exist yet. When I say that, I mean a ribbon that has been woven in such a way that the outer edge, when you look at it, is a slightly different weave and often a different sheen than the rest. It's a way of weaving that reinforces the outer edge. What was common was taking strips off a piece of fabric that was pretty, folding the ends under, and then sewing it on top of the garment they had. There were also other kinds of weaving that don't make a selvage edge. You might want to look for search terms like inkle, heddle, and tablet. If you want inexpensive DIY options, braids and cording are a great way to go. You can learn these pretty quickly, and I like to use sock weight yarn mostly. You can also do some stitching. Hand stitching can be as simple as just tacking down your seam allowance or sewing a straight line parallel to your hem. You can have simple embroidery or you can have incredibly ornate embroidery depending on your skills. It's way beyond my skill. But remember, even medievally, 
a lot of times people would find something or purchase something that was beautifully embroidered and then cut it apart and sew it on the clothes that they already had. This is called applique, where you add a fabric to yours, often that's cut out in an interesting shape. And then finally, number nine, you can paint stuff on. You can paint, stencil, or block print different designs on your fabric to get either a heraldic image or essentially a logo or a different repeating pattern that you found in a historical source that you think looks really cool, but there's no way you're going to afford a fabric that's woven to look like that. You can get linoleum stamps, you can get wood block stamps, it's, you can basically use stamps, it's stamping, and modern fabric paints do a good job. There are lots of tutorials for this if you want to get into it. I recommend you take a look at them. So here's an example. This is the tunic of King Roger II of Sicily. The pattern is nothing exciting. It's a basic rectangular tunic. It has that around keyhole but offset neckline like we talked about and a somewhat fitted lower arm. It has a wide enough top arm that they did away with the underarm gusset. Moderate fullness, calf to ankle length probably depending on the height of the person wearing it. What makes it amazing is the embroidery. All of the embroidery on the sleeves and the lower hem is incredible. It was done by hand and then embellished with a ridiculous number of pearls. Western Europe had a love affair with pearls. But if you wanted some of this look without opening your own embroidery studio, you could, for example, make a stencil or a block for that large repeating design that you see on his lower hem, and you could have a little bit of this look yourself at a fraction of the cost. So in summary, there are nine ways that you can change your simple tunic and make it more. All these things take a basic tunic and make it so much more, but you already have the basic skills under your belt to do this. And that's it. I hope that you have a wonderful day and that this brief video is able to help inspire you and help you build an eye for seeing the structure that underlies the clothing we see in historical images. Thank you for your time.